first of all, uh, you should know Professor Dugard that uh, America's so-called uh, leading leftist intellectual, Noam Chomsky, virtually de denied the existence of the Israel lobby. Uh, I just want to say the criticism from the KKK, or as we saw here in the Zionist KKK, that white liberals were race traitors did not stop Martin Luther King from criticizing white liberals from the left, as he did in his left from Birmingham jail. Uh, a quick statement and a quick question. I was part of the anti-apartheid movement in the United States. And I want to say that um, that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a purely advisory, non-binding, non-enforceable, ignorable, even by the UN Secretary General then, International Court of Justice opinions that compelled the end of South African apartheid. It was practical resistance, including boycotts, economic and cultural boycotts, international and international investment movement, the practical consciousness raising value of those, and ultimately international sanctions. Opposed by Noam Chomsky and called problematic by Mr. Finkelstein, they compelled the end of uh, South African apartheid. My question that I have is actually from an Arab American friend of mine who lives in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and heard Mr. Mr. Finkelstein's uh, lecture a couple of weeks ago in Michigan. And her question, which she desperately wanted me to answer, was um, Mr. Finkelstein now says that Palestinians and their supporters should even talk about Zionism, calling that, quote, a Starbucks discussion, unquote, which I consider not only dismissing, dismissive, but ridiculing. Don, would, would, question? Okay. <laughs> would, would Nazi, neo Nazi, pro Jim Crow, pro apartheid, and other white supremacist solidarity activists, or even white liberals, have had or have the right to tell Jews or blacks not to condemn time. Rape. With 15 seconds over time, so you lost money for that. <laughs> and there's some. Here's the second part. The ideology of white supremacy. I'll give you one sentence, wrap it up. Um, the ideology of white supremacy and Nazism, slavery, Jim Crow, and segregation and apartheid. Based on his business and voice interview. That's not one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> you have a response? I guess the obvious response is do you want to talk to yourself or do you want to talk to the rest of the world? If you want to talk to yourself, you can use any slogan you want. But if you're serious about trying to enlighten people and get people to act on the basis of reason and facts, and we try to use a language which people in an ordinary conversation or on the basis of their own ordinary moral intuitions will understand. Now, when I was a young man, I dismissed everybody who I didn't agree with as a fascist pig. Well, I don't think that's convert and that made me feel great. <laughs> but I don't think it converted many people. And frankly, I don't think that sort of language should convert people. Because we're not talking about revelation. And we're not talking about uh, sudden, sudden conversions. We want people to act on the basis of reason and facts and logic and good, solid moral judgment. And it's just not very useful if you want to get people to act on the basis of that and not stir them up with some sort of demagogy it's not useful to use slogans. And that comes from somebody who, for a large part of his life, used slogans. Do we have a question in the back? Oh, uh, Mr. Finkel, I had a lot of questions about the omissions from your lecture. Uh, at the 1967 war, you omitted any discussion of the Arab League rejecting any peace, negotiation, or recognition of Israel, and rejecting the acceptance of territory taken. You also omitted to mention that Israel has withdrawn from more territory, that would be the Sinai, and Gaza, than it has retained. You also omitted the current government of Israel, the Kadima Party, was elected on the basis of withdrawing from the, the occupied territories, withdrawing some, to reaching peace. And there's no one to accept it. And your whole point seems to be premised on the argument that the 1949 armistice line, some sort of border, is in your opinion, legally, was that armistice line magically transformed into an internationally recognized border? 